Good evening, everyone. So, uh, thank you for coming uh, to this lecture. So, uh, today's uh, topic is uh, about uh, CCS uh, carbon capture storage. So, I will introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Ian Wright. And, uh, uh, Ian Wright is uh, Deputy Director, uh, Directorate of Science and Technology uh, at the uh, National Oceanography Center, UK. And he leads a uh, uh, group working on seafloor uh, geological and uh, structure control of uh, field flow at uh, varying uh, scale with original application of hydrothermal flow and volcanic uh, edifice uh, evolution. Uh, this work has involved uh, synthesis of uh, ge geochemical and geophysical data, uh, real time sea monitoring, and uh, water column geochemistry into uh, integrated uh, model of uh, fluid flow. Uh, this uh, integrated geological geophysical experience is uh, being uh, currently uh, applied to fluid flow at SIP and CO2 reservoir storage research. Uh, currently, he is uh, lead, leading research on seafloor emission of methane gas release from uh, Arctic Sea hydrate uh, distribution and to project on understanding the uh, potential environmental risk and uh, developing monitoring technology for subseafloor CC storage. The uh, lecture two project uh, uh, com uh, comprise to comprise the uh, uh, EU uh, fluid subsea CO2 storage uh, it impact on marine ecosystem. It means eco two ECO two, and uh, the UK uh, funded uh, quantify, quantifying and uh, uh, monitoring for potential ecosystem impact of geological carbon storage, uh, KICS, uh, QICS, uh, for uh, which uh, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Wright is a uh, lead uh, NOC uh, principal in investigator and a uh, member of the uh, science and steering board of bo both uh, projects. Uh, Professor Ian has a uh, uh, extensive uh, experience in working with uh, stockholders to uh, transfer research into applicable uh, policy uh, management and uh, operational advice. Uh, his title is uh, uh, ECO2, uh, Science and Technology for Monitoring Measurement and uh, Verification of uh, Offshore CCS Storage Site. Please. Thank you very much for those uh, kind words and thank you very much for the invitation to uh, give this lecture um, seminar uh, this evening. Uh, firstly, uh, there's two reasons why I'm, I'm here. Um, the first is to describe to you some work that we're doing in uh, the uh, Europe and in the UK around the issues of carbon capture and storage. And the second reason is that <coughs> as part of that international EU project, uh, not, om not only am I uh, leading um, some of the science, but I'm also responsible for the development of international collaboration. And uh, part of what we want to do with this uh, ECO2 project, and it's something that we want to do in uh, the UK, is to develop international links, because we think that um, a lot of what we're doing in uh, the UK and the EU uh, obviously has interest, application, uh, and um, very strong collaborative uh, effort in doing this work. The other final point I would make, want to make is that um, what I'm going to present is not only uh, some of the work that I'm doing, but I'm essentially representing something like 70 or 80 researchers that are part of ECO2. So I'm just a a mouthpiece or a fronts person for uh, something like 70 to 80 uh, people. So what will I actually talk about? I'll talk about the background of uh, carbon capture and storage. I'll talk about the ECO2 consortium, which is this new EU project. I'll talk about the science objectives and aims of this uh, project. I'll talk about the, pro the project structure, but um, we won't um, spend too much on that. I'll describe in some detail where we're proposing to work 
uh, in this project, uh, and that is a mix of both uh, existing storage uh, sites, but also natural CO2 seep sites, and that is something that um, uh, people Japanese researchers are also doing. So that is one area that we uh, have and would like to um, extend collaboration in. We'll talk about research cruises and there are opportunities um, coming in this calendar year for uh, Japanese research groups to come on some of these research cruises that we're proposing. Then I'll move into talking about the strategy and technology for carbon capture and storage. Uh, and then we'll um, try and have some sort of summary at the end. So that seems a bit daunting, but um, we will work through that uh, through the next while. So what is it about carbon uh, capture and storage? I guess in an institute like this, where everybody is trying to uh, develop alternative fuels to where we are um, at the moment around fossil fuels, a lot of this um, shouldn't make too much of a surprise to you, but essentially if we're going to um, try and restrict ourselves to only a two degree increase, then we are going to need alternative fuels, alternative energy sources. One of those is uh, CO2 uh, storage, uh, and I think there is now um, evidence that and data that would suggest that CCS can be a relatively cost efficient technology, uh, especially for those countries that uh, have existing infrastructure, uh, depleted oil reservoirs offshore, and still have um, significant coal reserves. How is this all going to uh, work? What, are the, what is the scenario? What are the potential energy fuel sources for the future? I think most people now accept that this is going to have to be a mixed portfolio of um, energy uh, resource. Uh, different countries will obviously have different balances of uh, efficiency, renewables, biofuels, nuclear and carbon capture and storage. So each country will probably vary this uh, slightly, but um, I think for most countries, carbon capture and storage is going to be part of that mix of getting um, ourselves into having a reasonable energy security, energy supply, but uh, try and keeping ourselves within this uh, two degree warming. That is the challenge. In Europe, uh, CCS is um, quite strong, or very strong in fact, and um, some of the um, evidence for that is that the EU has recently uh, selected uh, at least initially six uh, CCS demonstration projects. Uh, one of them is in the UK at Hatfield, one of them is at Rotterdam, uh, and the other one of interest is the one here in northern Italy. There are others in those blue dots, but it's these three here, um, offshore uh, Italy, offshore Netherlands, and offshore UK, where the storage of those demonstration projects is going to be held. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is three of the six initial carbon capture and storage demonstration projects in Europe the storage will be offshore. Uh, so I think there is um, strong interest around what are the options in offshore storage. The EU has also said that it will fund up to 10 additional uh, demonstration projects in the future, uh, and that will be something like another 3 billion uh, euros the UK, separate from the EU, so in addition to what the EU is going to fund in the way of demonstration projects, the UK has committed itself to somewhere between two and three demonstration projects, each of which will uh, be funded to the value of about £1 billion. Pounds. 
Um, and the first of those, unfortunately, has just fallen through, um, largely uh, because of the difference in price. But the government has reaffirmed its desire to have two or three demonstration projects, each with offshore storage, but each uh, demonstrating different capture technology. So it is likely in the UK that we'll have demonstration projects one around uh, post-combustion capture, one around pre-combustion uh, capture, and a third around oxyfuel ca capture. But each of them will have uh, offshore storage. The UK, um, and this, the UK is only one example, but uh, Europe um, has set itself some pretty stringent targets uh, around CO2 emissions uh, into the future. And the UK has probably set, um, of all of Europe, has set itself um, some probably the, the hardest uh, emission targets. And it is in fact legally bound um, to do this. So it has three um, bits of legislation uh, which provide various targets uh, the first of which is the Kyoto Protocol, where um, there is a commitment to cut um, a particular uh, target by 2012, and you can see that we might actually get to that target. Um, well, we, we might. Uh, and then there are various other um, legal acts. There's the Climate Change Act of 20, uh, 2008, which is a legal commitment to cut emissions by 80% uh, by 2050. And then there is recently uh, a reaffirmation of this in the budget of 2009, which says that we will have a 34% cut by 2020. So you can see that these are the um, targets uh, for each of these uh, emission uh, levels and particular dates. Uh, and you can see also the baseline there. So the UK does have a quite um, difficult target to hit with uh, its CO2 emissions between now and 2050. And in that regard, um, Europe and the UK are looking very, very seriously at options around CCS in general and carbon capture uh, storage offshore. And you can imagine uh, there being a number of particular um, storage options offshore. You can have uh, depleted oil reservoirs and there are a number of those in the North Sea. You have a, an option of storing in deep, sa deep saline aquifers and from work that's um, ongoing we know that there are such um, deep aquifers beneath the North Sea. And then if you move further offshore into deeper water, then you have options around gas hydrates, deep sea sediments, or even um, storage in the oceanic crust and serpentization processes. But as you can uh, imagine, is the further offshore and the deeper water that you go into, the safer these storage sites will be. Uh, but that comes obviously at a cost. Industry um, wants obviously to be here on the shelf at shallow depths and there are people um, arguing that we in fact should be looking out here where there will be very little argument about the integrity over thousands of years of these storage sites. It's an ongoing debate. So the ECO2 consortium, um, as I said earlier, consists of um, a large number of uh, people. We have um, something like 24 different research institutes within the EU project, <coughs> excuse me, including uh, Statoil, and Statoil um, is important, and I'll explain why um, later on. And we have um, institutes from nine different countries uh, and the project is coordinated by IMF Guillemar which is um, one of the uh, premier uh, marine labs uh, in Germany. 
The project originally has um, a budget of 10.5 million uh, euros. That is the direct EU funding that's been put into um, the project. The member states uh, from Norway, Germany and UK, Italy are also contributing something like another 30 million euros in the way of additional funding for the research cruises. So in totality, the project is worth something like 40 million uh, euros. Uh, the project started in the middle of last year and will run for uh, a period of uh, four years. How did the, this project um, evolve? Um, it's interesting, it, it initially ev evolved around co uh, companies like Statoil that felt that um, there wasn't enough information around our understanding what science we knew about what would happen if CO2 leaks from these sub seafloor storage sites. So what we've developed is um, a project that has uh, researchers that have come <coughs> out of ocean acidification research. So we have a group of people that are actively involved around uh, ocean acidification, changes of pH, how that will affect um, animal life, calcareous animal life in particular. We also have um, a group of people that have come out of looking at natural uh, seafloor seepage. This is uh, both CO2 seepage and methane seepage and there are a number of uh, geological environments um, around the world, mainly around um, thick sedimented uh, continental margins where we have uh, CO2 and methane um, being released at the seafloor. Uh, and we also have those people that have been started the CCS, carbon capture and storage um, industry, and are concerned uh, with uh, or about the leakage of um, CO2. And the final uh, aspect of why we've developed this project is <coughs> up to this point, there's been a lot of work in Europe um, and in the UK around understanding the capture technology, understanding issues around the transport of CO2 in pipelines, and how you would physically inject CO2 into a storage site, maybe 800 metres to 1,000 metres beneath the seafloor. So there's been a lot of work around capture, transport and storage. But if we're actually going to implement um, carbon capture and storage, then we need to address this issue here of if, and I stress the word if, if there is a leakage, what will be the impact of that leakage on the marine environment? And also the issue around uh, public assurance and what do we need to do around monitoring these storage sites to ensure um, that we can verify uh, their long-term storage. And when I say long-term, we're talking thousands of years um, if we're going to implement carbon carbon capture and storage. So the objectives of uh, C, uh, ECO2 is to uh, investigate the likelihood of leakage from uh, sub seafloor storage sites, uh, to study the potential effects of leakage on benthic organisms and marine ecosystems, to assess the risks of uh, sub seafloor carbon um, storage, what is the, the total um, storage life risk to develop um, concepts and technology around um, monitoring strategies. What processes do we need to understand about CO2 leaking on the seafloor? What technology, what sensors do we need to develop uh, to put on the seafloor or have in the water column that can detect uh, CO2 leaking out into the marine environment? And then all of that was to be uh, underpinned by scientists providing some basis for providing uh, best environmental practice. The e EU wanted this project to develop some working guidelines for 
the, a future CCS storage industry, what what uh, would be the best environmental best practice uh, for a future CCS storage industry? So the project is broken up into um, 11 different uh, work packages uh, and those with stars are the ones that I will be uh, concentrating on but you can see that we have um, a, a work package looking at the cap rock integrity so there's been a lot of work looking at the reservoir property of the storage site but not so much work about what is the structure of the cap rock or the seal to this reservoir and is there any evidence of fractures or uh, pathways to the seafloor? We want to understand um, what happens to CO2 fluid uh, as it comes onto the seafloor. How does it come onto the seafloor? What, what would be the gas flux of CO2 coming onto the seafloor? What happens to the CO2 once it gets into the water column? Does it change into some other chemistry? Uh, what and if it does, what impact does that have? Um, then we were looking at um, the impact of leakage on ecosystems. There are a number of other work packages here that I won't spend a lot of time talking. And then I will talk um, a little more around monitoring techniques uh, very briefly on numerical modeling. And obviously uh, the re one of the reasons why I'm here is the issue um, around potential collaboration. So, that is the structure of uh, Eco2 uh, uh, Consortium or project. So the first work package, as I've said, is looking at this issue around what is the structure of the sedimentary uh, se uh, sediment sequence from the reservoir to the sea floor. And as I've said, there's been a lot of work um, around the reservoir, but we understand not so well what happens to fluids if they escape, how might they escape from the reservoir at depth um, down here, how might they escape up through the sea floor? Are there particular geological structures, uh, fluid conduits or pathways that will get CO2 up onto the sea floor? And if that is, will it be concentrated uh, or dispersed? Will, is, is the CO2 going to come up along faults or other pathways. So we'll be doing quite a bit of work around trying to understand different leakage scenarios and trying to understand the geological structure that might constrain potential leakage locations and the rate at which CO2 will come out. So this work will involve looking at existing storage uh, sites where we'll be doing quite a bit of um, seafloor multiple seafloor multi multiple uh, multi-beam mapping, but also we'll be doing some uh, high resolution subsurface geophysics um, as well to understand uh, the structure of the existing storage sites. The second work program is around this issue of what is the uh, fluid gas flux uh, coming from the seafloor. And what we're trying to um, identify here is chemical traces of CO2 that might be coming out of the sea floor. There is this issue around uh, the potential mobilization of toxic metals. CO2, as you know, is a very reactive gas. Is it going to entrain other um, metals if it um, ascends through the sedimentary system? And we're trying to wrap all of that up into some numerical models. And some of the experiments we'll be doing, um, uh, examples here, we'll be deploying uh, seafloor landers. Uh, here are some in situ mesocosm experiments, trying to look at um, respiration rates uh, and consumption of CO2 at the seafloor. And here you can see some acoustic um, uh, backscattering imaging of um, bubble plumes through the water column uh, being emitted from the sea floor. So that is the type of um, work that will, <coughs> excuse me, will be done in, in that particular uh, project. 
Then we have this issue about what happens to CO2 once it is emitted into the sea floor. There are a number of things that we uh, think will happen. Uh, the bubble size will change as it ascends through the uh, water column. Its chemistry may well change as it ascends through the water column. Um, and then there's the issue of is the CO2 being released as a free gas or is it being released as a dissolved phase or is it both? And if it is one or the other, does that have an impact on uh, its subsequent fate in, into the water column? And then we're trying to wrap all of that up into um, a numerical model. So that is some of um, the work that we will be doing in this uh, particular uh, pro in this particular work package. There's also the issue around what is the impact of CO2 on um, marine ecosystems and particularly uh, benthic organisms. There's been a lot of work in, uh, in laboratory experiments where animals of different um, animal f groups have been exposed to CO2 for periods of days to weeks. We know now how much CO2 uh, may cause changes in pH that will kill animals. But now we're beginning to under trying to understand a little more about the subtleties. Does um, uh, higher CO2 concentrations also have um, effects on their reproduction, their respiration rate? Are there more subtle effects that has an impact on these ecosystems apart from just whether they live or die? And we do have some evidence that in fact that, that does happen. And the other thing that we haven't done um, yet is to try and do this in the field in situ with a, a, a complete ecosystem. So the work that's been done in the lab has focused around particular monospecific animal groups. What we're trying to do now is understand the impact on a in situ uh, ecosystem and in situ benthic fauna and try and understand the effect of CO2 coming through sediments um, having an impact on um, animals on the seafloor. As I said earlier, we do have some other projects around uh, risk assessments, economic and uh, legal studies, and there's another work package around public perception. Um, and as we know now, public perception around the development of these new technologies is um, or can be quite a significant um, barrier to the development or implementation of these new technologies and I think if you look at um, in the past issues around the development of nuclear energy and the, the potential development of CCS then we need to think very seriously around the public acceptance of this technology and what level of assurance can we as scientists provide about the integrity and safety of this, of this as a, uh, a new clean uh, technology. So it is an important uh, part of the project uh, and it's something that probably environmental scientists haven't, um, haven't dealt with um, or had to deal with uh, strongly in the past but I think we have to in this particular um, issue. Um, as I said earlier we're also having to develop uh, ideas around monitoring techniques and strategies. Uh, if we can understand some of the issues or, and environmental processes in the work packages one to four, then that can provide guidance around what monitoring techniques, what parameters, what physical parameters, what chemical species do we need to um, monitor on the seafloor that will give us early evidence of CO2 leakage and how might we actually verify the quantity of CO2 coming out of the seafloor. This is going to be, I think, a very um, major issue. If we are going to have a carbon capture and storage um, industry, that industry will be paid to store CO2 beneath the seafloor. So there will be a 
carbon trading scheme, and there is already the development of a carbon trading um, scheme in Europe. So if there is an industry that's being funded or paid uh, to store CO2 in the ground, if it leaks, it will want to know how much CO2 is leaking out of the storage sites. So it minimizes um, the uh, payments it has to make back into these carbon trading emission schemes. So there is a, a strong emphasis um, or drive for the industry to understand and verify how much CO2 is coming out of these, or potentially coming out of these storage sites. And that raises the issue about what is the natural CO2 flux at these sites. If we discover CO2 coming out of a storage site, is it the CO2 that we've injected um, last year, or is it the CO2 that's naturally coming out of the seafloor um, before we started um, these natural, uh, before we stored uh, in an industrial scale CO2. So there are some issues there that need to be um, worked through and understood uh, and measured. Um, the international collaboration, obviously, um, I've said about that already. And the other point um, is that uh, this is all around trying to develop um, best environmental practice uh, for the uh, EU around the development of a future CCS storage industry. So I would like to now turn to the uh, study sites that we are proposing uh, to work in. And this is largely constrained by this diagram uh, on the top right here, which is the phase diagram for CO2. And this um, shouldn't really come as a surprise uh, for many of you. So here is temperature, pressure, and you can see that we have essentially three states. We have a liquid uh, part of, or phase of this diagram. We have a solid or hy hydrate, uh, and then we have a gaseous phase uh, for CO2. And if we're, what's interesting is that in deeper water, then obviously we're down here. We might in the deep sea, if we have a leakage, you might go from a liquid to a solid phase. If we're at continental slope depths, say 500 to 300 meters water depth, then if we have a, uh, a leakage from such a depth, then you might be going from a liquid to a hydrate. But at shelf depths, say let's say less than 100 meters water depth, then if we have um, a, a leakage, then potentially we're going to go from a liquid to a gas phase, and we're going to have a gas leaking from our storage site. So it's in that context of trying to understand what happens at different water depths that we have um, devised the storage site, the study site, should I say. So we're looking at um, the two existing storage sites off um, shore. So these are the only two current offshore CCS storage sites, both operated by Statoil of Norway. One is here in the northern Norwegian sea called Snovit. The other um, is Sleipner, and I'll talk a little bit more about Sleipner um, later on. We are also looking at um, natural CO2 seep sites. We know that there are a number of natural CO2 seep sites. There's one here in uh, Norwegian Sea at about 250 meters. We've discovered one here just offshore of Germany in about 35 meters. And there is obviously some very shallow ones associated with uh, volcanoes in Italy. But we're also looking um, potentially um, with uh, people from Jamstec looking at natural CO2 seep sites south of Japan in the Okinawa Trough. And these are very deep seep sites, and that's why they're of interest to us, uh, because these are particular seep sites are down at 2,000 metres. And I'll show you an image of what um, CO2 looks like at that, at that depth. And then there are these um, potential demonstration project uh, seep uh, storage sites in uh, the White Stars. So 
we have a range of um, sites that we're proposing to look at and we've already started looking at some of those uh, and they cover a range of water depths from uh, 80 metres at Sleipner down to 2,200 metres um, at Okinawa trough. So as we know um, at Sleipner uh, we have uh, a storage site where gas is being stripped from uh, natural gas and the CO2 is being then uh, injected about three kilometres away from Sleipner and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, as I said we'll be looking at natural CO2 seep sites here are some examples of what a natural CO2 seep site looks like. Uh, you also have um, natural um, shallow CO2 seep sites uh, around the Japanese islands. And this is another experiment that we're proposing. This is um, a UK experiment where we will um, have a, an injected controlled CO2 release experiment where we will drill from shore in uh, Scotland in a marine lock and we'll drill about 300 metres from shore um, out beneath the sediments and inject um, CO2 beneath sediments and let that uh, CO2 rise through 5 to 10 metres of sediments before coming up onto the sea floor. And that is an experiment that um, Japanese uh, groups will already uh, uh, will, will be involved with. So this is an experiment that we will um, start in May this year. So we believe that this is the first controlled CO2 release experiment where we will have CO2 not being released at the seafloor but beneath the sediments. So we understand the process of CO2 um, buffering up, rising up through the sediments, being buffered uh, potentially being buffered chemically as it rises through the CO2 and then looking at that um, it being emitted on the seafloor. So we have a number of uh, cruises that have been run by the various marine institutes at <coughs> these sites. So you can see uh, down the left hand side here the various uh, sites that will be visited, uh, the various ships that are being uh, sent to those particular sites. Uh, and then the lead institutions of, um, for each of those. Um, and as I said, there is an opportunity uh, for further collaboration on, on these cruises. Uh, and there is um, a very strong possibility, um, if people are interested, to participate in this particular cruise uh, being run by the National Oceanography Centre uh, later this year. This will be a cruise to Sleipner, uh, this will be a cruise of about 24 days in September. So if people are interested, then there is a poss the possibility of um, coming to sea with us on that particular cruise. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, what we're planning to do um, later on. So uh, <coughs> Sleipner is uh, one of the more interesting uh, study sites. As you are probably aware, um, Sleipner is being um, a storage site since 1996, 1996 uh, and it's a storage site where there's a, at least a million tonnes of CO2 being injected there per annum. The water depth uh, is 80 metres uh, and then the storage site is about 900 metres beneath the sea floor. And in the area of Sleipner, we are seeing some evidence of um, gas migration uh, in shallow uh, seafloor sediments. And as you well know, there is quite um, an extensive um, field or distribution of methane ex escaping uh, around the North Sea. So there is quite strong evidence in parts of the North Sea of uh, natural uh, seepage in the way of methane uh, and localised CO2 and we're, what we're trying to do at Sleipner is understand better the relationships uh, between uh, CO2 uh, at depth in the reservoir and how it might escape 
um, or leak to the sea floor. So that's one of the things that we want to understand is the shallower structure of the sedimentary sequence at uh, Sleipner. So what we're proposing to do uh, at Sleipner in September is run quite a comprehensive uh, AUV uh, survey. And we, you can see here, um, this is the production platform of uh, that Statoil are running. So this is the pr um, production platform. This is where they um, uh, strip the CO2 from the gas stream and then they uh, inject the CO2 back out um, into a point about here. And this red line you see here is the distribution of the CO2 plume in 2008. So every two years, uh, Statoil um, run a geophysical survey over the uh, storage site and they image the CO2 uh, plume by uh, seismic reflection techniques and you can see this is the distribution of that plume in 2008. So in September this year we will run a survey over this um, part of this storage site to undertake some high resolution seafloor mapping and what we'll be running is um, some high resolution multi-beam, uh, high resolution side scan, we'll have a chirp profiler and we'll also have a, um, a camera uh, taking images of the seafloor. So all of that will be done with uh, this AUV. So the types of data that we will acquire, here is some data. Um, this is not from Sleipner, but this is a type of data that we'll acquire later this year. Uh, and you can see um, if, if there is any evidence of uh, seafloor seepage in the way of pot marks, as you can see here, then we will very um, ably image those. Uh, one of the interesting things is if there is any form of seepage on the sea floor, what happens reasonably quickly is that um, CO2 or methane seepage is, starts to uh, host bacterial mats. And if there are bacterial mats on the sea floor, then they tend to um, show up as areas of um, high acoustic backscatter and then we can these these bacterial mats are, are, are white and they can be associated with uh, the precipitation of uh, carbonate so potentially using side scan data we can start to map the distribution of bacterial mats that might also provide some image or information around the um, expulsion of fluids on the sea floor. And here are some examples of uh, uh, cold water corals in this case um, being imaged by side scan. In um, Snowvit, uh, which is the storage site in the northern northern um, Norwegian Sea, you can see that there is very um, strong evidence of pot mark. These are pot marks in the area of the Snowvit field. And in the Snowvit field, um, the injection is in, in fact slightly different. The gas that they're extracting from the Snow, Snowvit uh, store, uh, field is in fact shallower than where they're currently um, storing or injecting the CO2. So it is the reverse of uh, Sleipner. At Sleipner, the CO2 is being injected at a relatively high level compared to where they're extracting the gas. At Snova, it's the reverse. The CO2 is being injected deeper than where the gas is being uh, produced from. Um, I mentioned natural CO2 seep sites. Um, here is one example of a natural CO2 seep site in the um, North Sea, this is the juiced salt dome. So at, de at depth, we have a salt dome. And as a consequence of that, we have a series of uh, faults that are coming from the top of the salt dome to the seafloor, along which we have 
the propagation or flow of CO2. So there is CO2 that is um, being uh, emitted at the sea floor and it moves up these faults. And if we look at uh, measure uh, the concentrations of methane and CO2 in the water column above the site, so if we measure up here in the water column, we get we can see that we have an elevation an elevated CO2 reading as we go across this um, juiced salt dome, and we get down to a pH of uh, 6.5. So that's very low pH for the marine environment. Earlier, I said that um, we were going to work um, in the Okinawa trough. Here is some um, pr prior work that's been done at um, Okinawa Trough, and you can see here we actually are down to a pH of 5. And you can see um, here droplets of uh, CO2, so these little bubbles here you can see are droplets of CO2, and here is an example of a hydrate pipe. So this is a solid form of CO2 because of the temperature and pressure. What's interesting though is even though we have a pH of 5 and we have CO2 being emitted at the sea floor, we still have animals living in that environment and they still have calcareous shells associated with them. So it's those sorts of things that we're trying to um, understand by looking at these natural CO2 seep sites. Panarea is another example. Um, and another study site. This is in the Bay of, uh, um, off, sorry, it's offshore of, of Italy. We've pr already done some work here. So here is uh, some acoustic imaging. Here is um, the wake of the ship. Uh, you can see this line down here, and here is the ROV, which is doing some visual observations of a seafloor. But you can see also that we can acoustically image one, two, three, and certainly four CO2 plumes coming off the seafloor up into the water column. So this is the seafloor, and this is the water column, and this is the sea surface here. And you, these are acoustic images of uh, gas bubbles rising through the seafloor, uh, rising through the water column to the sea surface. And this was um, a cruise that was uh, undertaken last year as part of the Eco2 project. And by undertaking some quite uh, specific ROV experiments, we can start to develop some concept about the flux of CO2 from the uh, seep site. Uh, and immediately you can see over a period of a couple of hours that there's quite significant natural variability of CO2 flux at this one site over a period of two hours. So we need to understand the natural variability of CO2 before we can say that a site um, is not leaking CO2 uh, in general and not leaking uh, injected CO2 specifically. So now I'd like to move on to um, the, a discussion around uh, strategies and technology for CCS monitoring. And there are a number of uh, observations I'd like to make here. Um, how we do that is going to be controlled by the nature and the scale of the storage site. And I'll talk a little bit uh, in, a, in a minute about the differences in scale of potential storage sites. Uh, the monitoring is also going to be um, different if we what dependent on the status and need for monitoring. So obviously you'll want to do a baseline monitoring survey before you start injection. So this is getting back to the argument that I made earlier. If you are a storage operator, then you will want to know whether there is CO2 coming out of the seafloor um, before you start injecting. Is there any natural CO2 seepage? Um, because if you don't establish that, and then someone comes along five years later and says there's CO2 coming out of your storage site, you're not in a position to say, well, it's natural CO2, it's not the CO2 
that I've previously injected. Then there is the issue um, around um, is the CO2 actually contained within the reservoir? Are we confident that the CO2 that we're injecting is staying within the reservoir? And then if, if it's not staying in the reservoir, there's the issue of quantifying the leakage. How do we actually quantify the CO2 that is leaking out of these uh, storage sites? So there are a number of things that we need to uh, think about. So let's talk about the nature and scale of storage sites. If we look at the North Sea as one example, you can see that um, there's potentially two main types of storage um, site. The first is <coughs> what might be called an enhanced oil recovery or depleted oil reservoir. So these are oil reservoirs or gas reservoirs that have, have had hydrocarbons, gases um, extracted from them. They're essentially empty now uh, and we have the possibility of putting CO2 back into those depleted reservoirs. And here is one example. This is, uh, was once the shell um, operated field called Goldeneye. It sounds like a Bond movie, but it's um, not. Uh, so this is an example of um, a potential storage site. And if we look at the, um, the scale of this, if you projected the area of that reservoir onto the seafloor, it's about 250 square kilometres. If you want to look at the volume of ocean above that storage site, then it's something like 20 to 30 kilometres of volume of ocean above the storage site. And because this was previously a depleted oil reservoir or gas field, then it already has wells drilled through it. So potentially, if there is leakage, those um, previously used wells may well be uh, point sources of uh, future CO2 leakage. So you could say that this, there is more likelihood of um, CO2 leaking out of that um, site uh, as point sources than dispersed seep sources over a wide area. If we then look at the other type, these are saline aquifer sites. And these are going to be far, far larger in scale. So there's at least two orders of magnitude greater scale of saline aquifers. They provide far more storage capacity uh, for the future. Uh, remembering that uh, for CCS to be fully uh, implemented, we need storage capacity something like 10,000 times greater than Sleipner. So we need to really scale up um, the storage capacity. And the volume of ocean that you might need to monitor is going to be far larger as well. And because these have not been um, previously <coughs> drilled, then there's probably equal probability of point sources being a leakage site or dispersed seep sources being a potential leakage site. So that provides some scale context for how you might um, monitor that area of seafloor versus how you might monitor that area of seafloor versus how you might monitor that volume of ocean versus how you might volume uh, measure or monitor that volume of ocean. So the scale does have quite a profound effect on how you're going to monitor um, these storage sites. The other thing that we need to think about is how might the CO2 leak from these storage sites if that happens. And you can imagine that there is a range of potential leakage um, rates or scenarios. And just for the purposes of um, this discussion, let's say that we have um, a high discharge and a low discharge. So let's just say that for a high discharge uh, leakage, 
we're talking about something that is over 200 tonnes of CO2 leaking per day. And we're also going to say that it's a point source because we have um, a well casing leakage or hydro fracturing um, of a seal cap coming up along a fault. And we know that that uh, leakage is all going to be coming out of a relatively small um, site. The contrary example might be that we have a low discharge. And in this context, let's say that low discharge is something less than 20 tonnes of CO2 per day leaking from the seafloor. And let's also say that that is going to be uh, dispersed. It's not going to come out as a point source at a wellhead or a, along a fault. It's going to be dispersed in some way and it's going to be over a very extensive area of a saline aquifer system. So the scale and how the CO2 leaks out of the seafloor is going to drive uh, or necessitate um, quite a diverse way of monitoring the seafloor, monitoring the ocean, uh, and you can imagine that any monitoring um, methodology is going to be staged in um, different levels if you uh, can demonstrate that CO2 is leaking from a reservoir and uh, when it might actually get to the sea floor. So if we now look a little bit more at this, this concept, if you look at um, current EU reg or proposed EU regulation about offshore CCS storage and the, the UK is um, essentially uh, using the EU legislation. All of that legislation <coughs> is focusing down here about monitoring of the storage site. So all of the regulations, all of the best current best practice is trying to demonstrate that the CO2 is contained within the storage site. And it's this boundary, this purple line here, which is the cap rock, which is the important boundary that triggers some, res sorry, some response by the regulator or by the operator. But I would argue that that requires a pretty specific understanding about the geophysics that you're using down here uh, to quantify any CO2 leakage across this boundary. If you want to use monitoring down here to understand the flux, the volume of CO2 coming across this boundary, then I think you're going to find it very, very difficult to do that, trying to understand um, any geophysical parameter like changes in velocity, changes in uh, uh, gravity, um, whatever it might be, uh, then you're going to have to um, understand quite specifically changes in the geophysical parameter and CO2. So I, I, my personal view is I think that is going to be very, very difficult uh, to use these techniques to monitor CO2 coming across that boundary. Yes, these techniques are very useful to demonstrate that the CO2 is contained in this boundary, but it's not going to be uh, useful to measure the flux of CO2 across this boundary. So how are we actually going to do um, this? Well, I think there are two observations that I would make. Um, the first is, it is very unlikely that if there is a CO2 leak, that CO2 is in fact going to be the first uh, fluid that is actually emitted at the sea floor. Um, and you might ask me why um, I say that. If we look at um, a sedimentary system here, you can see that we have a reservoir rock, we have a cap rock, then we have an overlying uh, sequence of sediments, and then we have a sea floor. So that's, you know, most of us understand that's what the sea floor looks like and the sub sea floor looks like as a sedimentary sequence. But that, that sequence of sediments is not only um, layered with respect to um, 
sedimentary characteristics, it's also layered with respect to poor fluid chemistry. So down here we will have um, CO2 as a poor fluid. Here we might have saline fluids in the poor fluid. And certainly within the uppermost 30 to 50 metres of sediments, where the sediments are unconsolidated, uncemented, we will have um, free pore fluids which will be reduced. And then we might have 10 to 30 centimetres of um, oxidised sediments where we have bioturbation turning over the very superficial seafloor sediments. So if we have CO2 leaking out of our storage, that CO buoyant CO2 plume is going to be dry being um, ascending up through the sequence. And that buoyant CO2 is going to be driving uh, saline fluids um, upwards. And those saline fluids are going to be driving these uh, reduced pore fluids. Um, so what we're saying is that if we have CO2 coming out of this reservoir, what you're likely to see is in fact anoxic or reduced fluids coming out of the seafloor first. Then you might have saline formation fluids coming out next. And then ultimately you might have um, CO2 coming out last. So we argue that you will have precursory fluids before CO2 are being emitted at the seafloor. Uh, and the second point I would make is the seafloor is going to be a far better place to monitor the flux of CO2 leaking from this site. We've got a far better um, opportunity of making direct measurements of CO2 than trying to make inferences or inversions of geophysical data um, at this boundary here. So the point I would make further make is that at this boundary, at the seafloor, we can make a number of uh, physical and chemical signatures of CO2 lo loss. There are a number of things that happen when CO2 or reduced anoxic fluids uh, come out of a seafloor. So the things that we can measure is decreases in pH, we can measure um, free gas bubbles, um, and all of those measurements are a far more tractable uh, problem to solve uh, at the sea floor here than trying to measure um, something very remotely, maybe a kilometre beneath uh, the sea floor. So there are physical techniques um, now being developed around um, a passive and a, um, active acoustic imaging. So the, this is the techniques where if you use multi-frequency echo sounders, you can invert um, that data to give you bubble size populations. So you can actually measure the, the bubble population of bubbles coming out of the seafloor. You can calculate the volume of uh, gas in those bubbles. If you know the ascent rate, you can work out the flux rate. So that is certainly one te technique um, that uh, groups are working on. There are also groups looking at the um, whether we can use chirp data to look for shallow gas um, and there are groups uh, in the UK that are trying to uh, develop this. Uh, there are obviously physical techniques for imaging um, bubbles in the water column. Uh, and here are some data actually not of CO2 but this is methane. So this is, these are methane plumes uh, coming up under the water column. This is a, in a water depth of about 100 metres. And you can see um, the individual bubbles coming up and being deflected by uh, the flow, water current flow of the ocean. And here you can see um, a ship with multi-beam, um, which has mapped the sea floor, but it has also mapped uh, a water column in three dimensions and you can see here a, a plume of methane into the water column. So there are various groups working on how to image bubbles uh, into the water column. Chemically we can also do the same. So the chemical techniques that 
um, could uh, indicate um, fluid expulsions, uh, things like <laughs> elevated salinity, uh, elevated dissolved manganese, dissolved iron, uh, obviously uh, acidity, a, a drop in pH, um, higher H2S, uh, and lower dissolved oxygen. <coughs> you might ask yourself, well, can we detect those things at the low enough limits? Well, I think we're beginning to get to a point where the answer is in fact yes. So if you look at um, these various uh, uh, chemical parameters, the current lower limits for uh, iron and manganese are now down to nanomolar. We can measure methane down to 0.2 of a nanomolar. Salinity, we've been doing that for a long time at uh, four or five decimal places. Same with temperature. pH, um, obviously there are some very um, strong uh, work in Japan around developing pH sensors. And I think currently um, there are pH sensors that are down to 0 0.005. I think soon we will be able to get down to one order of magnitude lower uh, to measure pH. Uh, and s potentially we can also measure uh, CO2 directly um, using uh, microfluidic techniques down to three parts per million. So I would argue that we are developing sensors that can be developed, put on the seafloor for long periods of time that are potentially going to uh, allow us to uh, measure CO2 or other proxy for CO2 emission uh, on the seafloor very soon. One example of what's being developed is in the way of sensors. Um, this is a methane sensor. Uh, this is a solid state methane sensor. So here we have uh, a polymer. Methane um, is or diffuses into this polymer and as the concentration of methane increases in this uh, polymer, then the refractive index of a polymer changes. So all you need to do is have this polymer with um, a light shining on it. And essentially what you're measuring is the refractive index of the polymer and you've pre-calibrated that um, with, uh, uh, with methane concentrations. So there is one example of a solid state um, sensor that is uh, potentially deployable up to periods of six months, 12 months, or even potentially longer that is not going to require <coughs> excuse me, a lot of intervention and is suitable for long-term deployment. Another growing area is um, one around microfluidics. There are a number of groups um, around the world. Essentially what um, it is, is developing basically chemical laboratories on chips. So on chips no more uh, larger than what I'm showing here, you have a complete chemistry lab. And you have um, your reagents running around this chip uh, in these micro uh, channels, you have little micro pumps uh, mixing your reagents, uh, and all of this has been done to measure uh, dissolved iron, dissolved magnan manganese, or whatever it might be. And here is one example of a uh, one such sensor, uh, complete with all of the reagents um, deployed uh, on the mid on the Atlantic uh, Mid Ocean Ridge, just south of the Azores. And this is um, a 12 month deployment uh, measuring dissolved iron. So again, I think we are not completely there, but we're getting close to um, being able to develop um, chemical sensors that will measure uh, different chemical species on the seafloor in situ remotely for long term deployment. This raises the issue though, if we have sensors, how are we going to deploy them? Um, and there are potentially two ways. The first is by uh, seafloor observatories. So here is an example of um, a pretty crude seafloor observatory. Uh, and this is a seafloor observatory that we've deployed 
uh, in the Arctic Ocean and we've deployed it on top of a dissociating methane hydrate. And here we wanted to measure uh, the chemical and physical dissociation of hydrate uh, and measure the, relate, the release of methane um, into the water column. And here you see the first 10 months of data from this particular lander. This lander is still in the Arctic. We um, recovered the lander this uh, last, as in September 2011, and it will be deployed for one more year, and we'll recover it again in 2012. So here is an example of um, long-term deployments, 12 months or more, and here is um, a subset of some of the uh, chemical data from that lander. So you can see that we measured temperature, salinity, turbidity, and dissolved oxygen um, on the seafloor on top of a dissociating methane hydrate that is releasing methane free gas bubbles uh, into the water column. I've already shown you um, uh, the AUV that we will actually use in September uh, next year. There are some new developments in AUVs that are, is happening. Um, at NOC we're developing a long range AUV and when I mean long range it is a, a AUV that will be capable of being deployed for a period of six months. So you can uh, run this AUV to um, either 6,000 metres water depth for a period of 6,000 uh, 6, kilometres or six months. So you can imagine if you had an AUV uh, like this, then you could uh, pack it full of sensors that I've just described and you could actually have um, an AUV uh, doing regular surveys um, through that uh, ocean volume that I've talked about previously above these uh, storage sites. And an example of what you might get is this um, data from Mbari where um, you've, they've measured uh, a series of uh, different parameters um, from a glider uh, AUV in fact. So it is possible to um, have long-term deployments of gliders or AUVs uh, for long periods of time without um, access to ships or intervention by humans. These are all remotely operated. You pre-program them. They, can, they do have some level of artificial intelligence on them um, and they can modify their missions um, according to what they actually uh, observe. So, uh, in summary, uh, ECO2 is a new EU consortium. Uh, we have 24 research institutes, uh, including importantly uh, Statoil, who have granted us uh, quite um, extensive access to Sleipner and Snovit. Sleipner and Snovit are the only, currently the only two marine offshore storage sites in operation. Uh, and they are an important aspect of understanding the potential of leakage from the seafloor. A, a prime concern of the project is to understand the risk of le leakage um, and trying to study the potential effects on benthic organisms uh, and ecosystems and develop uh, from that, our understanding of what happens if there were to be a leakage, develop some comprehensive strategy and technologies around monitoring um, those storage sites. There is the development of um, a young or nascent uh, EU storage industry. Uh, there are going to be uh, demonstration projects on a commercial scale uh, in Europe very soon uh, and there are a number of us that are beginning to work with Statoil, BP and Shell uh, as potential storage operators uh, in the future. And finally, um, as I said at the, very, at the beginning, one of the reasons why I'm here is to uh, develop or further develop in fact, because there is already some strong collaboration, but to further develop 
um, links with uh, Japanese carbon capture and storage groups. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.